Hello, welcome to the next episode of the Perpetual Pilgrim, video tours of the Fatima region and beyond. This video is about the penitential path. In my last video, episode 4 of the outdoor tour of the Fatima Shrine, I gave a summary regarding the history of the narrow path that runs the length of the sanctuary on which people pray the entire set of mysteries of the rosary on their knees. But of course it was a brief account, and as I said required another video, so not wishing to leave the details fluffy, without further ado I retrieved my copy of Sister Lucia's autobiography entitled Fatima in Lucia's Own Words to hunt for the full story on how that tradition came about. The history about the penitential path, or at least that's what I and the English speakers tend to call it, is in Sister Lucia's second memoirs that were written in 1937. We know for certain the story took place after the famous apparitions of 1917, for Sister Lucia places it after them. However, she herself couldn't place the exact year. Other events around the story take place in the years 1918 or 1919, but since she included it right before the account of her father's death, which happened in July of 1919, we can assume it occurred in this year, 1919. She notes these years were a particular time of suffering for her, as she had, of course, promised Our Lady to accept whatever sacrifices and sufferings God would send her for the salvation of sinners. One of the worst sufferings Sister Lucia endured was her mother's continued disbelief over the apparitions. Her home life had been so happy, she had been the pet of the family, but the apparitions had completely turned all this around, of course, as part of the suffering she would be willing to endure for sinners. Her mother absolutely detested the vice of lying and made sure her children never told a lie. So she scolded Sister Lucia, beat her, tried to get her to confess it was a lie because all these stories were creating havoc for the family for a number of reasons. There was no peace with the crowds constantly asking to see the three children who saw Our Lady. Home life couldn't continue as normal with all the bother. The Kova Basin, where the family grew food, was completely trampled by the pilgrims. They even had to sell the sheep they lived on because it was too hard for Lucia and the rest of the family to tend them with the crowds. So their means of livelihood was getting curtailed, which was a serious thing for a poor family. They relied on their farm work for their daily sustenance. And of course, the anti-clerical socialist government could turn on the family as well. However, her mother's disbelief and her sister's disbelief continued even after the famous miracle of the sun. And this is why these years were painful for Sister Lucia. Her mother was still very harsh on her over it all, thinking her daughter was lying, even after the miracle of the sun. And the anti-clerical government was still making things very difficult, trying to get the pilgrims in those early days to stop praying at the cove where Our Lady appeared. Soldiers on a horseback even arrested and turned Lucia away from the cove around that time, circa 1919. On the way back to her home, one of them threatens to cut her head off with the sword and bury her right there to put an end to this nonsense once and for all. And yes, this happened after the miracle of the sun. So even then there was the continuing threats from the government and a serious lack of faith and disbelief. Lucia recounts one of the sufferings she endured was her mother's disbelief to the point that when she heard of her daughter's arrest by the soldiers during the day, she didn't come to her defense. Her mother remarked, if it is true that she saw Our Lady, Our Lady will defend her, and if she's lying, it serves her right to be punished. In all, this upheaval in their lives took a toll on her mother's health. She thinking her daughter could be lying about seeing the Mother of God on top of it, and getting arrested by soldiers. What a stress despite the unsupportive remarks she made. Sister Lucia continues from here. Such suffering on my part must have been pleasing to our Lord, because he was about to prepare a most bitter chalice for me, which he was soon to give me to drink. My mother fell so seriously ill that, at one stage, we thought she was dying. All her children gathered around her bed to receive her last blessing and to kiss the hand of their dying mother. As I was the youngest, my turn came last. 
When my poor mother saw me, she brightened a little, flung her arms around my neck, and with a deep sigh exclaimed, My poor daughter, what will become of you without your mother? I am dying with my heart pierced through because of you. Then bursting into tears and sobbing bitterly, she clasped me more and more tightly in her arms. My eldest sister forcibly pulled me away from my mother, took me to the kitchen, and forbade me to go back to the sick room, saying, Mother's going to die of grief because of all the trouble you've given her. I knelt down, put my head on a bench, and in a distress more bitter than any I'd ever known before, I made the offering of my sacrifice to our dear Lord. A few minutes later, my two older sisters, thinking the case was hopeless, came to me and said, Lucia, if it is true that you saw Our Lady, go right now to the Covadoria and ask her to cure our mother. Promise her whatever you wish and we'll do it, and then we'll believe. Without losing a moment, I set out. So as not to be seen, I made my way across the fields along some bypaths, reciting the rosary all the way. Once there, I placed my request before Our Lady and unburdened myself of all my sorrow, shedding copious tears. I then went home, comforted by the hope that my beloved mother in heaven would hear my prayer and restore health to my mother on earth. When I reached home, my mother was already feeling somewhat better. Three days later, she was able to resume her work around the house. I had promised the most blessed virgin that, if she granted me what I asked, I would go there for nine days in succession together with my sisters, pray the rosary, and go on our knees from the roadway to the home oak tree, and on the ninth day we would take nine poor children with us and afterwards give them a meal. We went then to fulfill my promise, and my mother came with us. How strange, she said. Our Lady cured me, and somehow I still don't believe. I don't know how this can be. And so the chapter ends there about the penitential path. First, it's so sad to think that after all of that, her mother still didn't believe. Again, this was part of the sacrifice. Not that Lucia was trying to force anyone to believe, but the fact that there was so much strife in her house over this, that was part of the suffering. And then, of course, going back over her account. Wow, I'm floored. Imagine a child to do that nine times in succession on her knees. Let's not forget what the land back then was like when Sister Lucia made her promise. Here's an overhead picture of the sanctuary shrine from the old days. I'm guessing this was taken in the 1930s or 40s. You can just see the Holy Rosary Basilica in the very early stages of the construction at the top. The square area is the Covadaria. Just look at that. Unlevel ground, rocks, dirt, certainly no paving. Ouch. I'm sure hoping she and her sisters wore knee coverings. For reference, I've also marked out the road she was talking about. It is a different little road and not the bigger main road that is in front of the sanctuary today. This bigger road is slightly further back from this other little road that marks the starting point. The squares also mark out the length of the future sanctuary. Here is the shrine from the 1980s or 1990s, I believe. What we have now is a luxury with the paved pathway, but even then, it isn't lovely. It is hot and slow going, and if you wish to do extra penance and not wear the knee pads, those tiny pebbles that get in under your knees, ow, it's painful. And the path is not even at the original length anymore. What we see in the shrine now is only part of the length. The sanctuary cut the path in half when they built the Holy Trinity Basilica, which opened in 2007. Here is a then and now comparison. So when you make a pilgrimage to Fatima and need a special request answered, it certainly is a good penance to do, 
the entire rosary. Yes, all mysteries said on your knees as you make your way to the Capilina. I've even seen people skip the path and go on the asphalt. Ouch, that is hot. Since they have cut the path in half, you're probably wondering, can you still follow the original length of the path? Well, the first problem is the Holy Trinity Basilica was plonked right on top of the original starting point, so that presents a challenge. If you start inside, you're going to smack into a wall. Also, even if you try from the outside, from the outside wall of the Trinity Basilica, they now have it paved with the Portuguese calzada cobblestones, so I would not recommend you start the path on the cobblestones. You will seriously wreck your shoes and knees on that. Of course, if you really, 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 really want to do the extra penance, well, it's up to you. Those cobblestones are already murdered with just walking on them for long lengths of time without comfy shoes. Even with comfy shoes. So, you're just asking for your purgatory on Earth. In any case, it's still pretty challenging from where it now starts. I recommend starting it at the new points they have now marked out. And you can finish the entire rosary going around the Capilina area on your knees, which is also a tradition here, so you can at least get the full penance in, even if not along the full length of the original pathway, without risking too much injury or damage than if you started on the cobblestones. I would also recommend that if you come during the summer months, you do it early in the morning or in the evening. There are less crowds walking in front of you, and of course it is a lot cooler. The Kova Basin of the Shrine just radiates heat during the day, especially with the asphalt all around. So if you're sensitive to heat, do pick a cooler part of the day. Some people do it at night too. The Shrine is much quieter and it is lovely and peaceful. And this concludes this episode of Perpetual Pilgrim. Thank you so much for watching. Please give us a like, comment, share, subscribe and hit the little bell so you never miss a new episode. God bless.